I start in Ireland in the mid-19th century, the time of the Great Famine, when, as a consequence of the failure of the potato crop, combined with the brutal policies and actions of the British colonial government, around one million Irish people died of starvation, and a further million emigrated, out of a total population of around eight million. Now, about 15 years earlier, in the United States, across the Atlantic Ocean, the Choctaw Indians were obliged to leave their traditional homelands in the southeastern United States and make a journey of several hundred miles to new lands that had been allocated to them. This was along a journey known as the Trail of Tears, became known as the Trail of Tears, where 13,000 people journeyed through the, a very harsh winter and around 2,500 people of that population died en route. So newly resettled, some 15 years later, the Choctaw heard about the plight of the Irish, suffering the consequences of famine, and decided to collect money to send as a gesture of support all the way across the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. And this act of generosity has been marked in recent years through numerous activities and through various memorials and statues. I mention this brief incident in history to introduce what I believe is or should be the spirit of international aid, the expression of human empathy and human solidarity across national borders and vast oceans of water. In the 20th century, 20th century particularly after the Second World War, we witnessed the emergence of the professionalized and increasingly institutionalized uh, aid industry. So we now have many, many organizations, many governments, particularly governments of Europe and North America, who have been actively involved in offering international aid. Here in this country, we've had, uh, in recent years, a government that has stated repeatedly its commitment to continue spending on aid in the face of often very harsh criticism from certain sections of the media, from some politicians, and from certain members of the general public. And yet, the money does continue. And together with that money, increasingly, there are funds coming from corporate donors that are in addition to individual contributions and the support from philanthropic organizations. So from a financial point of view, the aid industry is in reasonable health. However, I have very serious concerns about the current direction of international aid, particularly in light of the increasing involvement of multinational corporations as corporate donors to many international organizations. In order to understand that concern, it is important, I think, first of all, to understand that the aid industry, led by governments, has, throughout its history, balanced, on one hand, altruism, and on the other, self-interest. So, for example, aid has been, in many cases, given to certain countries on condition that those countries open up their markets to foreign corporations. Another example of balancing this self-interest and altruism is in light of the Syrian refugee crisis, where governments, including the government of the UK, have given money to countries such as Lebanon and Jordan in order to act as warehouses for refugees, in order to keep those refugees away from the shores of Europe. Now, I'm not suggesting that altruism and self-interest are necessarily opposed, but I think we have to ask very seriously, at what point does the pursuit of self-interest change the direction and focus of aid in ways that are against the interests of people who are suffering and in need of that support? What happens to groups of people suffering and in need of aid who don't offer the opportunities for immediate gain by foreign governments and corporate interests? There are examples of many millions of people around the world suffering and in need of aid, who pass under the radar for precisely that reason. So in recent years, we've seen increased involvement as donors, multinational corporations. And this is just an example taken from the website 
of Save the Children, the US branch of Save the Children, where you can see many large, well-known multinational corporations who now give considerable sums of money to a well-known international non-governmental organization involved in aid work. This involvement of such corporations adds an extra level of complexity and concern to this relationship between altruism and self-interest. And there are three particular reasons that I have uh, cause for concern about this relationship. Firstly, I believe that it has the potential to redirect the programs of aid organizations. Corporations give money typically to organizations such as Save the Children in order to do particular projects, particular programs that they perceive to be in their own interests. How does that potentially refocus the efforts of aid organizations? So there was a study done last summer, this one, Fit for, Purpose, Fit for Whose Purpose, which at one point reports, as private sector initiatives become more central in UN efforts to respond to global challenges, they aggravate the shift from democratic global governance to a pay-to-play system. So what they're talking about is how UN organizations such as UNICEF, for example, which have in the past received funding from governments, have been able to work in a reasonably transparent and coherent and strategic way, are now finding their work being increasingly fractured as they respond to the particular demands of corporate donors who are not subject to the same processes of accountability, a pay-to-play system. So, a second cause for concern, alongside the potential redirection of aid, I believe we also face the reality of aid organizations being profoundly compromised due to the nature of the funding that they receive. So, for example, Save the Children taking money from oil companies that have a history of environmental destruction, from food and drink companies that are literally feeding a global epidemic of childhood obesity, from financial corporations that were at the heart of the 2007-2008 financial crisis, which ordinary people around the world are still paying the price for and which continues to exacerbate inequality, and companies that are involved in the arms industry. So where does that leave us in terms of this relationship between self-interest and altruism? What do organizations do to challenge business practices that are directly against the interests of children, that fuel poverty, inequality, poor governance, environmental destruction, when those same organizations are receiving money from corporations strongly implicated in those negative processes. And a third reason that I have a concern about this corporate involvement has to do with tax avoidance. So many of these corporations are world leaders in corporate tax avoidance, denying through numerous means the resources for governments to spend upon services for their own citizens or indeed for overseas aid. They withhold those taxes, give it as charity to aid organizations, and in the process, I would argue, perpetuate a vicious downward spiral where governments are deprived of funds, aid organizations increasingly become dependent on the funding of private corporations. So what's, what's the way forward? What can we do as ordinary citizens at this time to reclaim international aid, to bring it back and reroute it within human relations, to reinvigorate the spirit of empathy and human solidarity? Well, I'd like to suggest a strategy composed of three elements. Element number one, we need to educate ourselves. So I've already shown you from the website, very, very easy to, to see this information, which organizations, which corporations are funding which aid institutions, which aid agencies. But then go beyond that. You know, many of us here, I'm sure, give regular contributions to organizations such as Save the Children or UNICEF and others. Call them up. 
ask them about the nature of that relationship they have with various corporations. How are those corporations involved now in designing the long-term strategy, not just the immediate programs, but the long-term strategy of many aid organizations? The more that we ask those questions, the more that we challenge, the more, I believe, aid organizations will think very carefully about the sources of funding that they agreed to accept. Second element of my strategy, look for worthwhile local alternatives. Just being a large organization, a well-known organization, doesn't mean to say that you do the best job. And in my own work, I've witnessed many very small, very localized organizations full of very committed people who are very much aware of the needs of the population around them, often of people whose needs are great but who pass underneath the radar. So, for example, I'm now able to support a very small organization working in a poor neighborhood of East Amman, delivering very essential services to Iraqi and Syrian refugees, many of whom are living underneath the radar. And the third element of my strategy is to think not just in terms of financial support, but also in terms of political support. So, of course, around the world, there are many people who are suffering because of a lack of a decent political resolution to their problems. One obvious example would be people living previously under apartheid who required a political solution to their problems. However, many powerful governments lack the political will to bring about those kinds of resolutions and instead give cash in order to keep the situation at bay. From my own work over many years in the Middle East, I can say that the situation of the Palestinians faced with the Israeli project of settler colonialism are precisely such a situation. So in the occupied Palestinian territory, there are innumerable UN and uh, non-governmental development organizations delivering aid. And we can, as ordinary citizens, give money to such organizations. But I think we need to think carefully about whether that is actually the most effective way to bring about change. What about more political engagement, the pursuit of justice, supporting and calling for boycott, divestment, and sanctions of Israel until it complies with international law, as happened in South Africa? So in conclusion, I want to suggest that we are living at a very critical moment when we really need to think carefully about how we can bring about a change, how we can reclaim compassion, how we can force a rethinking of international aid. I believe that we can do it, but we need to take responsibility, not just for providing economic or political support, but for ensuring that that support is delivered in the most appropriate way and is not captured by the self-interest of elites. We must not allow international aid to become a vehicle for corporate PR strategies or for the pursuit of elite interests. So, you know, if in the mid-19th century, a displaced population of Native Americans could learn about and support people living the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, then what possibility exists for us in the 21st century with the incredible resources of information and communications and travel and still the ability to question and challenge organizations about the sources of funding, about the ways in which they work, the collaborations and partnerships that they pursue. Through this kind of engagement, I believe we can reclaim compassion. We can force a rethinking and a reshaping of international aid. Thank you very much.